open their hearts for the word that Nick has for them, and we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, it is my privilege now to invite up Pastor Nick to give the word. Thank you, Rob. All right, Adam, keep it going. Is that our Arsenio Hall show or what? A couple of y'all got that. I don't know. How many of you used to watch the Arsenio Hall show? Come on, see? Yeah, that's a few of you. Okay, all right. I just called you out in church. You see how that worked? That was easy. I can get you guys to raise your hand for anything. How about in living color? No? Okay, anyway. Okay. <laughs> Hey, real quickly, while it's fresh in my mind, Rob just mentioned it in his prayer, but there's so many things that we have going on here, and uh, if you know me, if you know my wife, we we don't like to be called the church of programs, right? Everyone says you should have a program for this or this, that, and the other thing. Uh, We we don't start anything or a ministry or a program or whatever it may be, unless the Holy Spirit leads us to, right? And but we do have a lot going on. There are some great things going on with, with our youth, with our young adults, with the women's ministry, men's ministry. And, and it's a blessing. And so thank you for being a generous church. We really are a generous church. We're able, you, y'all are generous people. And we get to be a gener- generous church and give back because of that. So thank you for that. Um, it's such a beautiful thing to experience that and see that. We were on the phone. Uh, I didn't talk about this first service, but we were on the phone with our coach. Because um, y- y'all should have a coach. Everyone should have a coach, right? Uh, who is a great friend of ours, who's a pastor in California, and we were kind of talking through our growth uh, um, as far as uh, people, kind of ministries and things that are going on, and he was just like, wow. He's like, you guys are in a good place, and he kind of was giving us some guidance and, and how to prepare for what God is doing, but I am just so grateful for the generous church you are, and, and that kind of reminds me that um, on the 4th of July, uh, we were able to do uh, an outreach event that we've done. Now, this is the second time we've done it on the 4th. We've also done it at other events, uh, community events around the community. Uh, and what we provide, as many of you were there, is a baby changing station and a nursing mom station. So we have two pop-up tents, 10 by 10 tents. Uh, and we got the best spot. We get in the shade. So with these big old trees, and we have those two tents in there. And, we, and they're fully enclosed with the, 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 the fans with the misters on top of the buckets. Uh, and one tent has uh, two, two uh, changing tables. Uh, diapers, wipes, all the things, snacks and water, and then the other one has a, a bunch of chairs and fully enclosed, a comfortable area for moms to nurse in in that area. Because you know, those bathrooms there in Town Square Park, when it's 115 degrees outside, aren't exactly a fun place to change a baby, but um, it was a beautiful experience, so thank you for all, give, give a round of applause for all the volunteers. We had a lot of volunteers show up and help out. From set up to tear down to walking through, praying for people, uh, telling people about the church and just what we have going on. And so um, that's the kind of thing that we get to do and give back to our city and be out there in the city. So thank you, Generous Church, Elevate Church. You guys have a fun fourth? Yes? Yeah, everybody has all five fingers still? Yeah, you have ten. I meant on each hand. All right, thanks. This is my uh, uh, corrector over here, right? Just listen for him some more. We'll see. Um, I'll try not to make any more mistakes, Adam. Um, uh, we had a great fourth. Uh, like I said, we were out in the town square all day. Many of you, I can see that we saw you there, um, and it's a great time to, to get out in the city. Uh, but how many of you are having fireworks still going off in your neighborhood? And keep, oh, wow, you guys don't have a good, no? You're not, that was us, sorry. No, I'm just kidding, it wasn't, no. We didn't have any. We actually didn't have any fireworks this year. We'll wait for Pioneer Day. That's the good thing about Utah. You get your second chance on the 24th. All right, let's get into it. You're, Rob hyped you all up, but I'm losing you fast. So um, I have one more plea before we get into today. Uh, and we, like I said, we have great volunteers. We have a generous church. We have a giving church. Um, I love our help squad is what we call our volunteers. But my plea is this. There is one ministry where we need a lot of help, and that is the transformation team. What the heck is the transformation team? You can call them transformers if you want. But uh, many of you know we rent a space from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They own this building. Uh, They meet on Saturdays, and so we're able to meet uh, on Sundays and a lot of times during the week or midweek worship, all of that, and utilize this building. And we have a great relationship with with, uh, them. But the, the building doesn't look like this. On the rest of, throughout the rest of the week, right? We have signs out front. We have our backdrops. We have all our instruments. All of this, a lot of it gets cleared away, our signage. And there's a team that does that. They're the transformation team. So they set up and they tear down. And we need help. We need your help. We have a great team uh, of volunteers on that team. But if you've been thinking, oh, I want to I wanna plug in and maybe once a month I can help out. But I don't want to tell people where to sit because they're going to yell at me. Or you don't want to be a greeter because you don't like to smile. Whatever it is. Uh, maybe that ministry is for you. So uh, you can uh, check out online. Oh, you got the, you got the, 
um, QR code up there or you can check in with our connect table. We'd love to grow that team because we got some ideas, but that's going to need more people. So we would love it if you sign up for that. Okay, let's move on. And if you were here last week, that was a terrible transition, huh, Adam? Was it? Yeah, I'll work on that. So if you were here last week, we talked, the message title was Freedom in Christ. And the three points that, that I gave to help us remember what we walked through uh, last week was stand firm, don't return, and let love burn, if you remember. What does that mean? Stand firm, standing firm on the word of God, right? Don't return, don't go back. Don't go back to when you were in dark darkness and in the bondage of sin, the slavery of sin. And let love burn, meaning serve one another in love. And we talked about it's real hard to serve one another in love when you don't know how to be loved yourself. And so if you were here, hopefully you were able to really let the Holy Spirit move and, and, and talk to you about what that means. Uh, but if you weren't, I want to encourage you just real quickly as we get started in here. Maybe part of what you have going on right now is because you're not allowing yourself to be loved by the Father who loves you, regardless of what your yesterdays were. And so we have to learn how to be loved in order to love others, which is what we're called to do. And we talked about how you are free in Christ to be fully known and fully loved by our Creator. And that's really good news. Amen? So let's pray as we jump into today's message and see what the Lord has for us today. Father in heaven, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your plan to reconcile us back unto you. Thank you that you call us sons, that you call us daughters, and that we can live out the freedom in you. Lord, I pray that you speak to us, that you prepare our hearts to give a word in season. Here we are obediently anticipating a word from you. We just lay it at your feet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Everybody's still awake, right? Okay, good. Front row is. Okay, so, so we're starting this series today called Collide. Uh, and, and this is a series. The beautiful thing is it's kind of leading. It's kind of going from last week, even though it's not part of the series, it's leading into, and that's all God, how the Holy Spirit connected this up with this next series that we're walking into. And by collide, what I mean is since the beginning, the Christian faith has been on a collision course with the culture around us. It's not like we go parallel with the world, right? It is, it is a collision course because the values of the world don't align with the values of our faith, right? And the priorities of the world don't align with the priorities of our faith. And the kingdom of man is not seeking the same things as the kingdom of God. And so we shouldn't be surprised as children of God when we experience conflict or tension, right? We should see the conflict and tension as confirmation that we're doing the right thing, that we are on the right path, we're going in the right direction. And as I was thinking through this, I kind of got a visual. And it's beautiful because we live in a beautiful part of the country where there's a lot of hiking, right? Anywhere from Snow Canyon to Zion to Bryce Canyon and everywhere in between, there's a lot of hiking trails, a lot of opportunity to get out in nature. And how many of you are, cause would say that you like to go hiking? You know, oh wow, there's a lot, see a lot more of y'all. See, hikers sleep in, I guess, I don't know. There wasn't very many hands at the 9.30, but so y'all can relate. This is good, okay? Um, so we have a lot of hiking trails here. And I want you to think about like a hike that you've been on. And you're going, and it's smooth. You've got the firm ground, a good trail. The trail is good. It's beautiful. And then you come to a point. It's been smooth sailing for now. But you come to a point where it's like, oh, this is... This is starting to get a little rough. You come into a rough patch on that trail where you have to kind of be careful in every step. Every step needs to be slower, and you have to be careful with each step because you don't know if that next step you're going to roll your ankle or end up on solid ground, right? You've hit that rough patch. And as I was thinking through this, an example to me of the vision that I saw was the Narrows. How many of you have hiked the Narrows, right? So leading up to the Narrows in Zion, you got this perfectly paved, Nice 2.2, I looked it up on Google, 2.2 mile path where you're just, right, you're just cruising, a little bit of ups and downs, you got the Virgin River to your left, a lot of times it's in the shade, you've got this great foundation, a cemented path all the way, but then you come up to the river where the dead end, no more river walk, no more cruising, right, no more firm foundation, and as you step into that river, and if you know, I haven't gone that far in, but I was talking to someone after first service. She's like, oh, yeah, I've been two miles into the narrows. It's great. I'm like, I haven't gone that far. Good for you. But, but if, when you're hiking in, as you step into that river, every step you take, the deeper it gets. You don't know if you're going to land on firm foundation, solid foundation, or if you're going to hit a rock that's loose, roll your ankle, or worse yet, slip and fall into that water, right? That's why they have those funky shoes that everybody wears uh, when you hike in there, those waterproof shoes, because you don't know. Is it going to be solid 
Or are you going to slip? We don't have an idea of whether we have a firm foundation. And, and I thought about that because these types of hikes or adventures are very much like walking through life trying to depend on worldly wisdom. Yeah. Taking those steps, not knowing if this is a firm foundation, right? You never quite know if you're going to land on solid ground. Because worldly principles and values are constantly shifting. Constantly shifting. However, what we learn from Jesus is to trust in the word of God. The eternally consistent teachings of scripture. And so let's get into scripture. Our first verse is going to be in Colossians 2. And I'm going to read these words of Paul from verse 8. Verse 8 says this. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. And that's important too. I love that I chose this version because of the high sounding nonsense, to be honest. I like the sound of that. But it's, it's high sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and bre- blood, but against spiritual powers and principalities, right? So it's those powers that's nonsense and it's human thinking. That's nonsense, right? And so in this one verse, Paul warns us about the logic and values of the world. And he calls us as believers, as as sons and daughters of God, to to stand firm on a different set of values. And those are the values of Christ. But even when we make that choice and we decide to stand firm on the things of God, we're still going to be faced with the values of this world. It's right before us. It's all around us. So how do we know? When something is worldly? How do we know when something is godly? How do we know when we are being led astray? Or worse, being held captive by worldly principles and teachings. So we're going to talk through this. And we're going to talk about this in week one of this series, Collide. And today's focus is stand firm. Stand firm. And it's great because, again, like I said, it flows from last week. If you were here last week, one of those very points was stand firm. And this, I can't say that we planned it so well that it just led into this, but that's what, that's what happens when you lean on the Lord. The Holy Spirit works in mysterious ways. So here we are. We're talking stand firm. And as we start to talk through this today, I'd like to draw your attention back to the hiking illustration that I brought up a couple minutes ago about going through a rough patch. I mentioned how with worldly principles and teachings, you're never quite sure if you're going to land on solid ground as, as principles and values are constantly shifting. And this is, this is an important lesson to remember. And uh, point one, I have three points during the sermon to keep us on track. Point one is worldly values are inconsistent. Worldly values are inconsistent. And let me help illustrate this point with something that I'm sure all of us here are very familiar with one of the primary mottos of the kingdom of man and that is just follow your heart follow your heart right thank you disney follow your just follow your heart right we've all heard that or another one would be do whatever makes you happy right or i like to say you do you right do whatever makes you happy that's what the world said and and these principles they sound good sounds great yeah follow my yeah i will i'll follow my heart but the problem is that they're inconsistent They're shaky, and they contradict the teachings of Scripture. The Word of God says in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, that the heart is deceitful above all things. And it is extremely sick. And New King James says wicked. Who can understand it fully and know its secret motives? So the world says, follow your heart. But the Bible warns us and says that the heart is wicked. That the heart is deceitful and it's confusing even to the point of it says, who can understand it, right? So don't try to get to understand your own heart until Jesus takes, takes hold of it, right? And Jesus says in Matthew 10, 39, he says, whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. So the world says, you do you, boo, right? <laughs> you do you. And that you need to make sure that you're happy No matter what, as long as I'm happy. But Jesus says that we should lose our lives for his sake. Meaning we trade all the stuff that makes us happy in our kingdoms for his kingdom. And it is in his kingdom where we can find deep abiding joy. Which is his purpose and his plan for us. And the truth of the matter is, is that the heart is inconsistent. Our heart is always changing. And falling in and out of love with 
any number of things, right? If you think about it, happiness, it's a moving target from day to day. Sometimes from hour to hour, this thing will make me happy and then I'll be good. No, wait, hold on. This will make me happy. That will make me happy. It's always moving. So let's be honest. How can you build anything stable off of these principles? It's like building a house on sand. And as you think about that last question, uh, let's turn to Matthew 7, 24 through 27. I'm going to actually read from the, from the Bible here. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Let's see if I can find it before you. Just kidding, it's not a race. <laughs> Just keeping you guys awake. All right, verse 24. Matthew 7, verse 24, it says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken them to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended. The floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Did you catch that? Jesus himself is commanding us to listen and obey his teachings. And when we do, we will be standing on a firm foundation. You like that? That was a song we just sang. You like that? That's well played, huh? Thank you. That's my wife. Anyway, (laughs) right? When we follow his teachings, we'll be on a firm foundation. No matter what comes, no matter what storm in life happens, when that foundation is in him, it will be a firm foundation. And I can tell you from personal experience That out of the many values that the world is going to throw your way, and many of you can probably tell me from personal experience, that none of those worldly values will allow you to stand firm when the going gets tough. Or as I like to say, when the defecation hits the oscillation, right? That's, maybe you get it. If not, that's the rated G way of saying it. You're welcome. Right? There's, there, someone got it. There it is. The delayed response. I love it. (laughs) Why? Because they're shifting sands of inconsistency. When the going gets tough, those worldly principles are constantly changing. So why are they so attractive then to us, right? Why does it sound so appealing to follow my heart, to seek out whatever makes me happy? Well, that leads us to our second point, which is worldly values are seductive. Worldly, worldly values are truly seductive. Another word for seductive could be enticing, uh, captivating, or fascinating, or, or many others, right? Either way, the truth is that many things, many principles, many words um, that the world tries to give us and tell us, they can look and sound very attractive when we hear and see them. And believe it or not, the Bible talks about this as well. Turn with me to Second Timothy, Second Timothy 4. Verses 3 through 4, and this is in the Amplified, and if you don't know, the Amplified Bible adds some words to be more descriptive, and so sometimes I really like to look at the the Amplified to dig into the meaning behind Scripture. In verse 3 in Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4 says this, For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine and accurate instruction that challenges them with God's truth. But wanting to have their ears tickled with something pleasing, they will accumulate for themselves many teachers, one after another, chosen to satisfy their own desires and to support the errors that they hold. Verse 4, and will turn their ears away from the truth and will wander off into myths and man-made fictions and will accept the unacceptable. Really take that in, what Paul's saying. He says in the beginning, for the time will come. Well, guess what? I would say the time is now. When you're seeing people what? Seeing people uh, not tolerate sound doctrine and accurate instruction. Because it challenges them with God's truth. We have to realize sometimes when something hurts, something is challenging, that's a refining And we pay attention and we lean into that. That's when we step into the purpose and the fullness of God. Or we can adjust ourselves just like the world does and say, that doesn't line up with how I want to live my life. So I'm going to go over here instead. And that is exactly what Paul is talking about, right? He knew that many people would spend their entire lives searching for a truth that lined up with their lifestyle. 
not lining their lifestyle up with the truth. Furthermore, many people reject the truth in Scripture. Why? Because it already contradicts their current lifestyle. They receive something meant to bring conviction and ignore it as useless. And I know you all know what I'm talking about. We see it every day. Here's the truth of the word. I hear it in church. I see a, a, a sermon preached on YouTube. It's like, ah, that challenges me. I don't like that. Let's check the next. It says it will, it will collect and stack teachers. Let's try a new teacher and see. I want to stay Christian because I believe in God. But I don't like what that pastor said because it challenges me because of the lifestyle I'm currently living. Let's try this guy. Oh, that one challenged me. Let me try this one over here. You're stacking up teachers of the wrong thing because you're trying to find what lines up with your lifestyle that's what paul is saying that's going to happen and again i'm telling you he said for the time will come and i i I would say and i'm sure you could agree with me the time is now the word of god is being altered right the christian faith is being altered to adjust for lifestyle and paul warned about that in second timothy and so we as the body of christ as sons and daughters of god we have to be people who continuously Fill our ears and minds with the only truth that we can find in this world. And it is in the pages of Scripture. And I will say, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Some people are like, oh, I love horror movies. They're great. It's just, it's just entertainment. Good luck with that. Be careful. The music business, I know people in the music business in, who have been in it. Be careful. What you listen to. Be careful what you fill your ears with. Be careful what you allow your children to listen to. Because music is very influential. I'm sure you've heard this before that Satan was a worship leader. He likes to use music. But also, this is, I'm going, I'm going rogue. But uh, (laughs) it says that he's the God of the air. And the further you get away from God and you're listening to, look at, I know we can listen to some secular music and that's great. I'm not saying like, la, la, la to everything you hear. But be very careful of the root, of the foundation, of the intentionality of that music, of the lyrics, of the person who's singing those music, the words that they're saying. Be careful what you listen to because you will fall into that category that Paul was talking about. But anyway, Satan is the god of the air. The further you get away, distance creates distortion. And he's the god of the air. So whatever message is coming to you, he's going to alter it so that it sounds nice. That sounds good. I can, this is good music. I can listen to it. Well, guess what? We're blessed in this time, in this season, because Christian music is pretty dang good. Yeah. We're showing the world what it's about. You know what? We were just at this hip-hop concert last night. It was Christian hip-hop. And, man, we had a great time praising the Lord and a couple of different churches and different people from the city gathering together over at New Life Christian Center. It was a good time in the Lord, right? And they were all spitting bars from the word, <laughs> right? And it was great. Our, the, Gar- our Garcia, the Garcia family, uh, we had Manny and Liz. Who else was there? David. David and then David joined them up there. And it, was, it was beautiful and, and other acts as well. But, and it was all exalting his name. And I totally got sidetracked. But anyway, <laughs> be careful what you listen to. Be careful what you're watching. We have to fill our ears, our eyes, our minds, our hearts with the truth more and more. Otherwise, the volume that the world is sending us is going to drown out whatever truth we have in us. Amen? Amen. So we have to be people who are continuously filling our ears and minds with the only truth, and that is the pages of Scripture. And the Bible is full of practical life principles that enable us to to live the abundant life that that Jesus talked about. And he talks about it in John 10.10. And he he, specifically tells us that this is the goal. He says, the thief comes only to... To steal, kill, and destroy, is destroy. but he says that I came, that they might, I love this amplified version, uh, have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Thank you, Jesus. That's his plan and purpose for you and me as a child of God. And you know, the enemy hates that. And what the devil can't fully destroy, he will seek to distract. He'll try to steal your time. He'll try to steal your treasure. And he will try to steal your attention. And that's why we have to stand firm on the word of God. That's why we have to abide in Christ. Like Jesus says in John 15, 5, my, one of my wife's favorite verses, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Are you trying to do it on your own? Jesus tells us, for without me, 
You can do nothing. And that's why we need to have daily time in the Word. I know you're all saying, daily? You're crazy. I don't have time to read the Bible every day. That's what the enemy says, right? And, and you know what? I get beat up too. I understand the distractions of life. It's hard. But we have to strive for that daily. As mercies are new every morning, starting in tomorrow. Let's try it. Get in the Word. And it's beautiful, this word, abide. Um, this is our word, my wife and I, our family's word for this year, abide. Every year we pray and seek the Lord uh, for a word or a phrase or something just to kind of keep us on track and what, he's, what we're believing God for in that year. We do the same for the church. For, for Elevate Church, it's a break ground this year. Uh, many of you know that. And for us personally, it's abide. And, and it's crazy because the Holy Spirit has been constantly reminding me throughout this year. God has almost got me hyper aware of, of when I am abiding in him, but when I am not abiding him in, as well, in him as well. And when you're not very aware of this, it can actually be a negative if you don't understand that the Holy Spirit brings conviction, not condemnation. So if you feel convicted for not getting in the word, that's good. Let it encourage you to dive back in. But, but I'm, I'm in the season right now of being so aware of when I'm abiding in him or when I'm not abiding in him that I've had some days where I've really beat myself up. Instead of letting the Lord refine me and lead me back to his closeness with him. And that's a distraction of the enemy. I'll tell you what. You know what he tells me all the time? Oh, you're such a pastor. You didn't read the Bible today. What kind of pastor are you? How dare you not read the Bible? You're no pastor. You can't preach if you didn't read the Bible every day. Every day I'm dealing with that right now. And I'm hyper aware of it because the Holy Spirit is preparing me for something. So our word is abide. Abide in him. John, there's your homework. Read John 15. She wanted me to give you homework. Blame it on my wife. <laughs> abide in him. And I, I'm sorry, abide in me and I in him. And whoever does that bears much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. Amen. So as you learn to point out the worldly values that don't align with the kingdom of God, you also need to spend energy pursuing the values that do align with the kingdom of God. And that leads us to the third point, which is, Allow the Spirit to guide you. Allow the Spirit to guide. It's not enough to just simply say no to the things and the values of the world. We have to take it a step further and say yes to the things of God. A lot of times in counseling, people will, will tell me that the thing that they struggle with. I'm struggling with A, B, C, D, E, F, G, fill in the blank, right? And, and, and it's like I just can't. I keep going back to it. I keep going back to it. And my, my first instruction is always you need to fill what normally you would fill with this, with the word of God. So much that that's overflowing and you're no longer seeking this and you're no longer going after whatever that is that ails you or pulls you away from him. We have to fill it up. So we don't have to not just say, no, I'm not going to do that. It's like, I'm not going to do that. And let me say yes to the things of the kingdom of God to fill that, right? And Christ gave us the Holy Spirit to be a guide and a strength in this endeavor. In John 14, 15 through 18, he says this. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. Verse 17, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. Jesus invites us to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. And sometimes we're so stubborn. You know that you know. Once you have a relationship with the Lord, the Holy Spirit's leading us every step of the way. And we just decide, mm, uh, eh, this sounds good though. I'm going to go this way for a minute, right? That's just the battle. But once we begin to follow God's lead, we will be able to experience the best life possible. The life that God has purposed us for. And a lot of times, that's not the life that you thought you were supposed to live. But it's his way, and it's his purpose. And again, that's where we find that deep, abiding joy that many of us see. And we will be constantly coming back to the only truth worth standing on at all, one that will never lead us astray. I want to give you a couple of uh, examples of many times in my walk, I've had to be very intentional and intentionally seek guidance in God's word and from godly people that he has placed around me because of what's going on. A lot of times it's a big decision, um, and it always goes with prayer and fasting, I'll tell you that. But, but the first thing is planting a church, right? We, if many of you know the story that, that my wife and I uh, got plugged in when we were dating at this one church, uh, and then our associate pastor there 
decided to plant another church, and this was all in Southern California. We went, we were two of 12 that went with him, and so from 2010, we started Elevate Church and uh, walked in, in, in volunteer ministry and ups and downs and all the things, and throughout that, we felt the call in 2016 to plant a church in St. George, Utah, and I was like, what the heck is it, like what, like, you know? What are you talking about, Lord? But, but there was confirmation after confirmation after confirmation, and the call was very clear. If you want to know the story, come to Welcome Home in, I don't know what month it is next, but, uh, and, and it, the call was very clear, but what happened is it seemed like everything was coming against us after that. Spiritual warfare, all of it, the noise of the world, everything. So we sought counsel. We sought the Lord. We prayed and fasted a lot. <laughs> we had to work hard to block out the noise of the world around us to see clearly God's truth. And the truth was that he was calling us to St. George, Utah. And once we found that and, and walked the, his ways, I mean, we didn't get out here until 2020 and we, we launched in 22, but, but God led us every step of the way once we got in the firm foundation and were led by his spirit. Another example is um, in that period, my wife can give a better time frame. I don't remember years, whatever, but uh, there was a time when I was in Bible college and I had to step out of, we, we both, for this, both worked for this restaurant group. I was general manager in operations, and she was um, training and development. And I realized that those hours and that stress and that job, I couldn't go through Bible college at the same time. And so I went back to hourly work. So I, was, I bartended my way through Bible college. How do you like that for real training? I learned a lot more in that season. That I can't remember the papers that I wrote, right? But... <laughs> But it was a great season, and there was a lot of refining. So in that, in this season, there was a time when uh, the, there was, uh, I think, 10, 10 restaurants that this restaurant group owned. And the owner, it was family-owned, but it was corporate. And she came to me, and she's like, hey, I want to offer you your job back, and here's a raise, and here's the benefits, and here's the things that come along with it, because we need your help. We need you. I'll give you the schedule you want, so on. I'm like, but I'm in school, all the things. This looked good from a worldly perspective. Right? We, had, we, were, we were starting a family with young kids, and, and this looks good, right? But we also knew that we were called to plant a church, and we were working toward that. We were following God's lead in that. And the Lord led me in that. The Lord led me to remain an hourly employee. So I didn't take that opportunity, which many people are like, what are you thinking? Right? That's right before you. Another example, maybe some of you can relate to this, is leaving the church. We thought that we were supposed to leave Elevate Church in California. There was two times in particular, but one, very strongly, we were like, oh, we're supposed to leave. We're supposed to leave. And there was this, it was terrible. There was this big split at the old church that we had come from. Um, and we had some, we had friends on both sides. It was, it was, it was terrible. But um, don't let the enemy lead you astray and gossip in the church. I'll tell you what, it's just, it's, I've seen the fruit of that and it's, it's bad. But God restores and there's a lot of restoration there. But anyway, uh, so our friends that were at that church we came from, they were asking us to come back. And, and there was a lot of opportunity in ministry there. And we talked to the, our old pastors there, and it was like, this would be great. And we were like, this, this looks beautiful from a worldly perspective. And we really thought that we were to go back and help them rebuild. That was our call, right? And so we met with our pastors. They counseled us. We sought the Lord in prayer and fasting. And it turns out that despite all the noise and what sounded good to us, and rightfully so sounded good to our friends, that was not what God had planned. And so we heard from the Lord in his firm foundation and from the Holy Spirit, and we stayed the course. And later on, we found out why were we kept feeling like we were supposed to go, because we were just in God's timing. Yeah. And that was to come out here and plant and elevate church here. We didn't know what it looked like then, but we just every step follow him and standing on that firm foundation. Another one is this, staying with Sogol. Sogol's my wife, and many of you know that when I came to Christ, we were dating. And I didn't know she was Christian when we were dating, but she was. Because she wasn't exactly walking with the Lord at the time either, right? And so I started going to this church. I was invited to this church. And I'm like, wow, this is different. This is great. And so I kept going. Eventually invited her. I told her it's weird. They raise their hands and sing. And, and she's, because I grew up Catholic. I didn't know nothing about that. And she's like, you mean they worship? And she's like, I'm like, you know that. She's like, I'm Christian. I'm like, you are. Yeah, anyway. It was a whole thing, right? So then we're, we're, we're dating. We're plugged in at this church. And God is refining us and changing us. We're serving and um, I, I, there's a brother, a, a friend of mine, and I looked up to him. He was on the worship team. He had a young family. He was an actor, and I was studying acting at the time. Anyway, so I'm like, yeah, any, any advice from him is good advice. 
And he's like, when I came to Christ, I was single. I became single just so it was me and the Lord. You should break up with her and you should just be single, you and the Lord. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. That's right. Because I had commitment issues. So I'm like, yeah, that's perfect. I'll do that because it's still with God, right? And, and, and my flesh wanted to do that. Uh, but I sought counsel and I sought the Lord. And, and I'm thankful that I listened to the Lord and my pastor at the time. And then so a few, fast forward a few more years, we're still at that church serving. And there's that pressure to get married, especially if you're, if you're dating in the church. Uh, so much to a uh, brother in Christ said to me one day, he's like, hey, man, how long are you going to keep dating your sister? I'm like, oh, Oh, man. All right. I gotta get, we got to figure this thing out, right? He meant sister in Christ, okay? All right. Just don't, don't just keep careful, YouTube. That could be dangerous. I'm taking stuff out of context, right? So there's this pressure to get married, right? And I felt, but, but I felt at that time that desire to be single again. And I even with the excuse of, uh, I just need to seek the Lord. Just, just me and God. This is a season for me and the Lord, right? Why? Because I got commitment issues, so it sounds good. So I was faithful. I sought the Lord, and you know what the Lord said? He said, a man who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Proverbs 18, 22. And I was like, okay, all right, Lord, I guess I'm getting married. And so uh, the rest is history. There's a lot more to it. But, but it was the firm foundation of his word that got me back on path when I thought all these things sounded good. And some of it right-minded, with the right heart, people giving me this advice, sounds good, looks good, is harmless, but it's not what God said. It's not the foundation of his word and what he had for us. So, it, so family, it takes devotion. And it takes effort to learn to walk in step with the spirit as you follow the teachings of scripture. And, and I'll mention this again. I mentioned it last service that a lot of times as Christians we come to Christ and we're like, okay, yes, I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth. Okay, I'm a child of God. I'm good. But when I say the fullness of God... There is a fullness of a relationship with God and walking, like I said, in step with the Holy Spirit that's available for us, that he wants to show us. And there's always going to be temptations to veer off the path and go adventuring through those rough patches like the narrows, right? But again, those temptations are only temporary, much like the rewards that those temptations promise. Abundant life is found in the kingdom of God. And the Holy Spirit was given to you and given to me as a gift to help us and guide us in that way. And listen, the world is trying to draw us into values that are inconsistent, that are seductive, and at worst, destructive. And so today, as we start off this this new series, Collide, we all have the opportunity to invite the Spirit of God, I'm sorry, to, yeah, to invite the Spirit of God to guide us through scriptural and biblical truth, the one thing that we can stand on knowing it will remain firm. The first step we have to do is to call it out and recognize any false truths or principles that maybe you were taught that they were true or maybe you just caught it from being in the world or or ones that you just believe are true right now. But you gotta be real and you gotta call it out if you really wanna be able to stand firm. Because again, When you receive Christ and you have the Holy Spirit, you know, as good as it sounds, you know there's something in you. And you have to pay attention to that and call it out. I gave a couple examples earlier. Let me review those, and then I have a few more for you. The first one is the ever-famous follow your heart, right? We learn that. We know, no, the heart is deceitful. Don't follow your heart. Or how about the do whatever makes you happy? Do what makes you feel good. Can you imagine what would happen if you did that? You can become anything you set your mind to. We like that one. Let me tell you something. I love basketball, and I'm actually pretty good, right? But I'm also in my mid-40s. So it doesn't matter how much of my mind I set to make it in the NBA. It ain't going to happen. Right? we got to be real. How about (laughs) just do what feels right to you? Do what feels right to you. Be true to yourself. Really. If you're true to yourself and yourself is not anchored in Christ, yourself will destroy you. And you know what? There's also, I mean, there's many more we can go through that, but there's also things that we may have even thought for sure. That's biblical. That's in the Bible because I've heard all my Christian friends say it. And there's one example I'll give you. God will never give you more than you can handle. We've heard that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that God won't give you more than you can handle. 
It does say that he won't allow us to be tempted without giving us a way out. You can find that in 1 Corinthians 10. But that's a far cry from not giving you more than you can handle. In fact, I'd like to challenge you to think of it like this. If God didn't give you more than you can handle on your own, what would you need him for? Because you can handle it. You got this. Right? God does give us more than we can handle. Why? So that he can show himself mighty in our lives. It's through us that his glory is seen by others. Because you can't handle it. What did Jesus say? You can't do, you can do nothing on your own. Without me, you can do nothing. Last I checked, the Bible says that his strength is made perfect in my weakness. And the Bible tells us that we can do all things through God who strengthens us. Not I can do it on my own or he won't give me more than I can. No, he's going to give me the strength to get through it because his strength is being made perfect in me. So we have to test all things. Lean into the spirit. Stand firm on the truth, of, on the word of God. And the next step is admitting how enticing and attractive some of these principles are. It does you no good to pretend like they're not. It does you no good to pretend anything, right? Like stop this fake it till you make it nonsense. Uh-uh. Let's be real. They sound good, right? Feels good to say, follow your heart. Do what makes you happy. Sounds good. Seems harmless. But it also does no good to think we can simply avoid the pervasive false teachings that are rampant in the world just because we don't like them. Finally, we've got to trust in the Spirit to lead us and guide us into and through all truth. And the beautiful thing about our God is that, that He really gives us a choice. He says, I set before you life or death. Choose life. So I encourage you, family, today to make a choice. Because you've got to choose before. If you're not in a storm right now and you don't make the choice in this season, everything's cruising, you're on the river walk, and it's paved right now, when you get to the end of that path and you hit a rough patch and you haven't made the decision to stand firm on Christ, good luck. Because as Jesus said, without him, you can do nothing. So I want to ask you, family, will you choose to take a stand today and every day going forward? Will you choose to trust the leading of the Spirit Will you make a daily commitment? Daily commitment. Oh, that, there's that word daily. Daily commitment to Scripture. Daily abiding in Him. And that is what it looks like to stand firm. And, and I'll tell you what, in, in prayer, we can pray our own words. We can lament to the Lord, and He will hear you, and He will respond, and He will love you. But when you pray the Word of God, there is power. And you, don't, you can't pray the Word of God if you're not reading the Word of God. You can't pray the Word of God if you're not listening to the Word of God. And it's beautiful because it'll start and you'll just be praying in English. And if you've been in, that, in the Word and all of a sudden it comes out, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down beside green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. It's like, whoa. Or you're in a storm and you're like, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. You, over. you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Come on. That's the word. How powerful is that? Because that's the firm foundation that we are all called to stand on. So I'm, I'm imploring you. I'm encouraging you. Let's all make a decision today to set things in motion. Get into a rhythm and be prepared so that when the noise of the world gets loud, it's an election year. The noise of the world's going to get louder. It's going to get louder and louder, and the world's going to be calling, and the, and, the, and the God of the air is going to distort that message. And if we're not standing firm, the house built on sand. The noise of the world is going to get loud, and what do we do? We let the truth of God's word speak louder than anything the world is telling us. So that when the rain comes, and when the wind blows, we can confidently say, that Christ is our firm foundation and truly then stand firm on the simple truths of the unchanging gospel. Amen? Amen. Just close your eyes and bow your heads. In order to know what that firm foundation is and that is Christ Jesus, 
That is his word. He is the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's him. In order to have that firm foundation, we have to have a relationship. The Bible says that when you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, that you will become a child of God. And as a child of God, you have that relationship. You have that guidance. You have the Holy Spirit to guide you. You have the firm foundation. When you open the Bible and read it, before you give your heart to the Lord, before you repent and you really have a relationship with God, it probably reads like a history book. But when the Holy Spirit is in you, it speaks, it leads you, it is a foundation. And if you don't have that, if you feel like you don't have that, you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, as a church, every, every day we say this prayer together. Number one, as a reminder to our relationship, of our relationship, but also so we know we have that firm foundation. So if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus and, you, and you're saying, you know what, today's the day, I want that firm foundation. I want a relationship with the Lord. And what does that mean? It just means you're saying, yeah, he's right. I can't do it on my own. I want to do it with Jesus. If that's you, just really quickly raise your hand in the air so you're saying to God, that's me. You know what, Lord, I, I'm sick of trying it on my own. I see that hand. See those hands. That's awesome. Beautiful. Amen. You can go ahead and put your hands down. You may have had a firm foundation with the Lord, and you were walking with God, and somehow, some way, you got led astray, tried to do it on your own, and now your foundation has cracks. It's sinking sand. Well, guess what? The Lord can restore the years the locusts have eaten. The Lord is the repairer of the breach. He's the repairer of those cracks of that broken foundation. And if you need him to do that to you, if you're coming back to him today, and you're saying, that's me, and you want to say this prayer, together with all of us. Just quickly raise your hand. You're saying, you know what? I'm coming back to you, Lord. I need that firm foundation right now in my life. If that's who, just go ahead and raise that hand and, and you're telling God, that's me. Amen. It's beautiful. See those hands. You can put your hands down. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your plan. Thank you. You are such a loving God. Such a loving God that you welcome us to you with open arms, that you give us free will, you give us a choice, but you say choose life. And Lord, you saw those hands choosing life today. So I pray blessing upon them, Lord. I pray that you give them heart and a hunger for you and your word, a desire to stand on a firm foundation in a relationship with you, a hunger for your word. And Holy Spirit, lead them and guide them into all truth. And Lord, we say this prayer unto you as your body, as, as your sons, as your daughters, as the family of God, declaring that truth. Church, if you would repeat after me, say, Jesus, come into my life, be my Lord, be my Savior. I give you my life. I believe in my heart, and I speak with my mouth that you are Lord, that you died from my sins, that you rose from the dead, and you are seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for me. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up on me. I lay my life at your feet. Lead me in your way. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Family, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. 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 Go ahead and stand to your feet. And we're going we're gonna to finish this service with uh, a great song called Firm Foundation. You may have heard it about 30 minutes ago. 35. And I love, I love how it says, just what we said. Rain came, wind blew, but my house was built on you. I'm safe with you. I'm going to make it through. And this song also says he's never let me down. He's faithful in every season. So why would he fail now? He won't, right? Guess what? When we sing that song, it's not just a fun song. When I say be careful little ears with you, what you hear, we're singing the word of God. That's scripture that we're singing. And so we're going to sing and finish out the service with this last song. If you raise your hand, all of you, prayer is available to you. But if you raise your hand, I encourage you, I implore you, anytime during this song, step out of your seat. We have our prayer team at either side of the front of the sanctuary, ready, prepared, and willing to pray with you, to pray over you, to stand in agreement with you. You may have questions, they can answer those. You may need a Bible, we can provide that for you. Please see our prayer team. They've been waiting, anticipating, and ready to pray for you. 
you know, again, the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. And prayer is God's design. And so you know if the Lord is pulling on your heart to receive prayer, I encourage you to receive prayer anytime. You can even go now if you want to step out of your seat and see our prayer team and get prayer. Family of God, let's sing this unto the Lord. Go ahead and raise your hand. Lift a hand to heaven. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you are a faithful God. You are not a God who denies us. You're not a God who turns his head from us. You listen, you hear when we cry unto you. And here we are obediently crying unto you. Here we are obediently saying, change me, lead me. Guide me into your firm foundation of your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you fill us to overflowing, that you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart soft and open and available to be led by you. God, I just pray for each and every one of us in here that we have a hunger to make time, to set aside time to be in your word. And I pray, Lord, that as we are faithful to do that, as we are obedient to do that, that the words, the, pay, 